So let me tell you where I think we are. We're in 1 Kings 18 and verse 30 is where we're coming from tonight. 1 Kings 18. Thank you guys so much for your help, your love. Joe and Jonathan got saved. Well, I don't know if they got saved here. They rededicated their life here for sure. Definitely got stirred up more, greater levels than they ever have. And these fellas go out on visitation with the visitation team. Uh, Tom and Mary head up, head up that, the, the outreach team. And some of you need to get back in that, you know, outreach business. Get back in that outreach business. How many souls have got saved this year or said yes to Christ, you know? 96 people said yes, and we have prayed with 364 people uh, in this ministry, outside of this ministry. Uh, that's, that's good, but that's not even partial what I want to see us do. I want to see us reach, there's 160, was it 168,000 people in, in uh, Blount County, I think they said alone. They said 70... 2%, 48% is unchurched, 47% is unchurched, and that leaves about what? 60, that's about 60,000 people that are unchurched. Now, I don't know exactly what that means to you, <laughs> what their definition is, but they, they included every church, and some of those places they call churches, I wouldn't call church because they're not preaching the message, so I would say... Yeah, that was 2022. I think it's come up some since then. It shows 139,000 in 2022. It was like 162,000 or something like that. But anyway, uh, a substantial amount of people, regardless of how we add it up. Let's just say for sake of conversation, there's 60,000 people who never heard the message of Jesus Christ, or they have no church, 60,000 people. Now, I'm not talking about the people who's filtered their way through here and left. I'm talking about the people who have never had the opportunity to hear the gospel one time. If they have heard it, they've rejected it, or they've never seen a good example of a Christian, born-again believer, walk into their life. Now, Pastor Fair and I, uh, we had the opportunity. We used, to, we used to go treasure hunting for the Lord. That's what we called it. Call it whatever you want to, because I think all of God's people are treasures to the Lord. Uh, lost or, or saved, they're his treasure. He loves them, and he, he, get, he sent his son for who? All the world. So we, we owe a debt to the world around us to preach the message of the gospel, to bring what we call revival. If you've seen my post when I was work, walking, uh, working on working on the building, uh, I was painting, and I put on a post. I said, it's going to take more than cool T-shirts and slogans to change the world and to see revival. We're going to have to have some people put in some what? Some work, some sweat. <clears throat> people will move church to church. Most of the people I've had here were not necessarily unchurched. About everybody I've had come to church here, just about, with the exception of a few that are still here, uh, we're moving from one church and they have transitioned on to another church or they're not in church at all. Now, and some of you may go on to another church as you, you know, but look, our role, our role as a body of believers is to what? Reach the lost. That's our job. And there's over 60,000 people in this county alone who have never affiliated them. They, they remain unaffiliated. <laughs> That's What was that movie, uh, uh, Oh Brother, Where Art There? He said, me and what's his name, we remain unaffiliated. Or is that what he said? Yeah, me and Willard, we're unaffiliated. But anyway. <laughs> so, you never seen that movie? Made it through the movie. You live with him and you can't make it through the movie? <laughs> she are you in oft <laughs> Anyway, so, so we must make a decision to bring what we carry to the world around us. Why should we get to do this every week 
for hours upon hours on end when others have never heard it preached one time. If this church is ever going to grow, we're going to have to get tired of being fans of the message and begin to carry the message. Now, now people will hang out with me until the message offends them or until they find something to disagree with. But generally, when people come here from other places, they come here in disagreement. So I expect they're probably going to leave here in disagreement. Very seldom do people come and say, you know, God sent me here. I feel like this is where I'm supposed to be planted. They come and say, I come from a breakup, a bad marriage, my last affiliation, my last place I was. Very seldom do you have people say, God sent me here, I'm planted here. I've got a few here, and they're really solid, and I'm thankful for them. Amen. And, and so when you, get, when you get solid, the Lord plants us in the church. Do you realize that? He plants us. He plants us where he wants us. He sets us in the body. We don't, we don't have choices where we go. I had a lot of people tell me, well, I'm looking for a church. No, you're not. You're looking for somebody to make you happy or to meet the needs of your children. I don't know how many people I've heard say, and we're not live, but I hope we play this on the air. I've had a lot of people come to me and say, you know what, I'm looking for something that helps them. That, that, you know, I need a good youth group for my children. I need to have a Sunday morning thing. We need to have something, you know, for the kids. And I'm like, you're, you're choosing where you're going for the wrong reason. You better choose where you're going for the message that the man of God is preaching and for the word and the truth that's coming out of his mouth. The revelation and the knowledge that's coming out of that man or woman of God. You better not choose where you go to church based upon your feelings. If you feel like leaving and you let your feelings move you, your feelings will move you the next place you go. When you don't feel like being there anymore, you'll just move on again. It'll be fun in the beginning, you remember? He planted you there. That's why it's not fun. You didn't get to choose it. There's a difference. When you get planted somewhere, you, you, God sets you somewhere. You don't choose where you are. That's the body of Christ. The Bible said he sets us each in the body where we belong. And we're set in there to bring our supply and to receive our supply. And when you're out of place, what, it don't operate. Somebody say amen. A lot of people tell me, well, pastor, did you do wrong by setting that person in a position? No, uh, no more than God did wrong by putting Adam in the garden. God give Adam an opportunity. A lot of times I give people opportunities because I see the value or the opportunity or what could come out of them, but it's their choice what they do with the opportunity that's given to them. You can absolutely disqualify yourself from the promise, the blessing, and what God has for your life based upon, listen to me, disobedience. The easiest way <laughs> for you to figure out where you're going is to get an altar. 18.30. Well, 1 Kings 18.30. Then Elijah said to all the people, come forward to me. So all the people came forward to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been tore down. Jezebel, Ahab, the nation of Israel had set up other gods and they were worshiping false idols. They were moved by their emotions and they were moved by fear. And it took a man of God who was not afraid to stand in the face 
of every prophet, every false prophet, every king that was in the planet at that time and say, call on your God. I'm going to take a break. Cut yourself. Do whatever you got to do because I know your God don't carry enough power to manifest greater than my God's about to. I come to tell somebody tonight, God is about to do something so great. It's going to set this world on its ear. God is going in a season of exposure. Tell me we're not in a season of exposure. Pastors dropping like flies. That's why if you show up somewhere that God didn't set you, you'll show up somewhere and before you know it, where you show up, it'll be a season of exposure. And when you get there, you wish you had never went. I know people that's already happened to that left here going somewhere else, and when they got there, they realized where they were going was not. You know, the grass is always greener on the other side. I'm going to say something. I used to say something. I'm not going to say it. but It could be on the top of a septic tank. That's what the front row said. Sticky situation, somebody said right there. Write this down. Write this down. Most times the answer you're looking for from God is not a provision. It's an instruction or a direction. Most of the time, the answer you're looking for from God is not a provision, but it's an instruction and a direction. The easiest way for us to maintain spiritual fire in our life is to possess a functional prayer altar. Someone was here today that I talked with after service, and they said this. They said that struggle is the greatest gift that God ever gave. I said, that's wrong, ma'am. I disagree. That's unbiblical, and I disagree with you. Struggle is not the greatest gift that God has ever given us. Jesus is the greatest gift that God has ever given us. And once he gives us him and the Holy Spirit, struggle is not really struggle. It's just part of the process. When you're going through something, you're going to go through it. What they say when you get when you're going through hell, what? Keep on going, right? Keep on going. Don't don't stop. Get an instruction and come out of that thing. And many of you are not praying. You're not praying for the answer. You're just pulling out of your wisdom or your resources or your emotion, and you're getting your answer from your mind, not your not your altar. If God hadn't sent me here, I'd have left three years ago. (laughs) You know, we'd have loaded up. God set us here. This is where we are. This is where God set us. I'm I'm the bishop of this church. I understand. But God told me, he said, Jeff, I'm going to take all the rabbit blood out of you. Rabbits runners. You ever seen a running rabbit? (laughs) They run. We used to kick bushes. We didn't have dogs when I was a boy. We walked creek banks, and we we kicked bushes to kill rabbits. It didn't hurt the bush. Was you complaining about the bush? Oh, the, the only reason you don't like rabbit is because you've never ate rabbit. Rabbit's better than chicken ever thought about being. Now, you just have to try it to understand, but it's, I'm telling you, it's fried wabbit. Wabbit. No, that's going wabbit. So, there's so many people who struggle to study the Bible fast and evangelize because the prayer altar is broken. The fire cannot fall until the altar is repaired. Elijah brought the people corporately together and said, look, this is the broken thing in the church. This is the broken thing in the nation. This is the broken thing right now with Ahab and Jezebel running the show. This is the broken thing. What's that? The altar. 
The reason why we're not functioning like we need to function is because we don't have a prayer life. Let me give you a tip. Tip number one for tonight. Are you ready? Find a place to get alone with God every day. Number two, you ready? Make an appointment. He should be on your calendar before anybody else is. I'm going to say it over here because y'all didn't think I said You got job appointments, you got schedule appointments, you got money appointments, you got nail appointments, you got hair appointments. Come on, y'all ain't going to say anything. But do you have a God time on your calendar? You know why we're having trouble? Because we don't have a time. I'm going to say it again. We're having trouble because we don't have a set time on our calendar where you get alone with God, set apart, consecrated, alone with God, not, not on your iPad, not on your computer, not in somebody else's devotional that they cried, wept, lived over, almost died over, and wrote so you could read and get goosebumps just like singing a worship song. I'm talking about get the Bible out. Get on your knees before God and listen to what he has to say. Read until you hear his voice. Pray until you feel his presence. Somebody say repair the altar. We have trouble because we don't have time. We have situations because we don't have an altar. We must have an altar. The fire cannot fall until we pray. In Acts 1.14, they were praying. In Acts 2, 1 through 3, they were praying. The fire fell because they were in prayer. The fire will fall on this house when we come to prayer. I've said for three years on Saturday night, we're going to see a move of God when corporate prayer is as much fun as a spaghetti dinner. Until this church gathers around more than a skating rink. We're just going to ride in circles like we're in the wilderness until we quit coming for a man and we start showing up for God. There's a lot of people that show up for religion. There's a lot of people that show up to hear a word. There's a lot of people show up because they got good church for their children. But is there anybody shows up because they had an altar? They had a place with God. Come on, somebody. I need to preach tonight. Is there anybody in here who got alone with God, heard God's voice, and said, God, let's go. If this is where you're leading me. Let's go. Say an altar. You better start praying. If you're not praying now in easy days, you'll never be able to pray in hard days. I've been a lot, around a lot of people started praying when they got in jail. As soon as they got the bail money, they was gone, and they was high before they got out of the parking lot. Why? Because it's trouble religion. Some of you get closer to God when you get cancer. That's why that person's theology was based upon struggle, because they feel closer to God in the struggle. God doesn't want you in the struggle. He wants you in his presence. Because when you're in his presence... The struggle doesn't bother you. you. Say, well, how do you know that? I got all kind of scripture for that. Paul and Silas was going to die in the morning. It's midnight. And they're singing. <laughs> they're singing songs at midnight. They were singing, I feel it in my hands. I feel it in my feet. I feel it all over me. <laughs> they, were sing they were Pentecostal, I guarantee it. So Paul was up dancing. He was shining his shoes. Silas was going. I'm telling you. 
Some of y'all better find a place where you can pray. You better find a place where you can worship. You better learn when you get in the middle of a problem. It's not the time to complain. It's the time to praise. And if you'd had an altar this morning, a set time with God, a time where you said, God, this is your time. Every single day that you wake up, you ought to know at this time, you say, I don't have time. No, you don't make time. Tell me what you don't do that you don't make time for. And tell me what you do do that you make time for. You make time for what you want to do. Right? Right? Some of you are like, he said doo-doo. Can I ask you a question? Can I challenge you to get your calendar out tonight before you go to bed and set a time for him? Let me say it again. Can, can I challenge you to get your calendar out before you go to bed? And set a time for him. For him. It's amazing how much time we've been given by him, but how little time we actually give him. It's amazing what we have given ourselves to or the world has pulled us into. You know why I want you to be blessed where you got all the money you need so you don't have to work so much to pay for what you have? Many of you bought into the world system, and now you're so deep in debt that all of your day is consumed with trying to get, and it's a weekly cycle, repetitive thing that goes over and over. And when I ask you how you're doing, you're like, I'm just so tired. You put yourself there. And can I say this? Can I say this? If you spend time with him before you do that, he'll renew your strength. He'll give you energy, a moment in his presence. You go out inebriated into the day. You get pulled over, he's like, breathe into this, please, because I think you're drunk. you got a problem. What's wrong with you? I'm full of joy. I met with Jesus this morning. He showed up in my house. <laughs> it was awesome. I ain't even drunk coffee yet. I'm on my way to Starbucks. You want to go? Come on, get in the car. It's going to be fun. Jesus is right. You, Jesus, scoot over. Come over this way. No, I know. I know. Let's go over this way. See, you've you got to understand, when you're, when you're going, he's like, what's wrong with him? That's what I was saying. I know. I know he's got some problems. Just let him get in. Come on. We're going to go to Starbucks and juice him up. Come on. <laughs> If I ever told you all about Pastor Farah, she's really good. She spends mornings with Jesus every morning. She needs two things in her life before she gets Jeff. So there's three J's in her life that are important to her in the morning, Java, Jesus, and then Jeff. And, and I can tell you this, I don't know which one needs to come first, Java or Jesus, but I know I'm always last. And those two are so important to me, I set up my life conducive so she can get both of those things. One of them I give her and one of them she has. Every morning when I wake up, I make her coffee first. Brilliant man. And I set it down. And she says, thank you, baby. Now, anytime I've not handed her coffee in the morning, she just looks at me. What'd I do? Where's my coffee? It's on its way. So, so are you going to schedule Jesus on your calendar tomorrow? Now, can I ask you, the next important part of prayer that many of us forget is that prayer is not a complaint session. There's nine 
different types of prayer in the Scripture that we teach. And one of them is supplication. Supplication is actually, and I've got it written down for the benefit of not being thorough. Say this with me, supplication. Yep. Are you ready? To ask humbly. Go into prayer like you don't know. Go into prayer like he's God and you're not. Earnestly. Luke 9, 29 says, and he prayed, and as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistening. Ephesians 6, 18 says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Prayer is a secret of, man, of the manifestation of God. Prayer is the place of destiny and transformation. Prayer is the place of destiny and transformation. If something's not working out in your life, you need to get into the presence of God. You need to find an altar. Some of you need to rebuild the altar. Can I give you the third point? Can I give you the third point? Make the place that you pray special to you. Why, Pastor? Why would you say that? Why would you? Yeah, I could go. I could go so many places with this. I don't know if I can because I don't. Wanna, I don't want to embarrass nobody. But well, I don't know if I should. So, I'm trying to think of another analogy. Lord, help me. M make the place that you meet with Him. Special. You say, why? Why, Pastor? Because there are a lot of places in your life and a lot of places in Scripture that were important to God. And it shows the value of you and Him. Have you ever been with anybody that just looked at their phone while you were talking or drifted off into the distance while you were with them? Have you ever been around somebody, if you're at the table with them, they're not even paying attention, they're doing something else? You've got to really lock in. See, what I'm trying to get you to understand is the value of the moment, the value of the place, the value of what's going on. You must determine in your heart to set aside a place. What kind of place? I don't know. Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall. He found a special place with God. He got alone with God. And before the man of God got out of the room, God said, give him 15 more. Why? Because he got alone with God at a special place. He shut out all distraction. The man of God looked down between his knees. Elijah began to pray, and he began to pray, and he said, go look for the cloud. He found a special place. You say, what are you saying? He, he knelt down and covered himself up under his prayer shawl, put his head between his knees, and said, God, send the rain. It was important. Just like your time clock's important. Just like your commission slip is important. Just like the sign on the bottom of the line. Just like your keys to your car. Just like where you hang your favorite jacket. Places. Needs to be a place where you and him go. That's why when I see people come up for prayer, come here, come here, Pastor Fair. You know, you see these real needy people that come to the altar sometimes, and they're controlling. They're in a controlling relationship, and they come to the altar, and they bring their spouse with them, and then they'll be standing there together, and then when the pastor comes to pray, they'll get their hand. They ain't never prayed with them in years, but they don't want you to either, so they're trying to hold them away from you. Try tomorrow to spend some time with him. Special time at a special place. A special moment. Scheduled. 
that you refuse to do anything else in your day unless you make sure you do that in your day. Why? Because that determines the value of him in your life. This doesn't determine value. This determines this is something you're committed to do. People will come to church until they move their commitment somewhere else. Then they recommit. Just because you're a member of a church or a member of a country club, I could join a golf club tomorrow. Don't make me a good golfer. I'd have to learn how to play golf. I got golf clubs. I can swing the club. I can hit the ball. I can hit the back of the net at Top Golf. I can smash that thing. That's about it. <laughs> I can get all my weight behind it, is all I can tell you. And then and, and, and it goes. But if there's that little bitty hole involved, you got all me so many strokes to get in that little bitty hole, that don't work out so good for me. I can be on the green in two and putt five more times to get it to go eight feet. I'm like, how did this happen? Let me tell you what happened. I did not prepare time to what? Practice golf. I could be a member of a country club golf course, don't make me a golfer. I can sit in church, don't make me connected to God. You know what's going to really prove out if you have a God connection? Not how much time you listen to what I know about God, but no, but the time that you spend with Him and you know about God. It's going to show up in your fruit, going to show up in your character, going to show up in your mouth. You know why most of the people that are still with me now in this rough season that I went through, I was praying about this this week. I said, Lord, why are, why are people dropping off like flies? He said, because they're not learning anything, Jeff. I said, they're not learning. He said, yeah. He said, you've been teaching for three years good, sound, doctrinal stuff, and some people have never showed up, and those people are the ones that are dropping off, and the ones that are not really engaging in teaching and learning, they're going to fall off. Why? Because they're not learning. They're stubborn. I said, what? He said, yes, they're stubborn. He said, they're set in their ways and they know everything and you can't teach them anything. They already know everything. And he said, most people are trying to go backwards, not forward. And you're trying to go forward. It's quiet. He told me in corporate prayer the other night, he said, tell them in this next season, he said, tell them not to look back and not to turn into a pillar of salt. He told me, he said, Jeff, tell them. He said, tell them. Other night, Cooper Bray said this to me. He said, tell people to quit looking at the destruction that's behind them, the fires that are blazing, the problems that's going around. He said, look for the fire that's in them and the fire that's in front of them. He said, tell them when they look back, all they need to look for is goodness and mercy. Because he said his goodness and his mercy will follow you all the days of your life. So many of you are going to have to put it in your spirit. When I look back, I'm looking back for his goodness, and I'm reaching back for his mercy. I'm not looking for problems, not looking for situation. I moved on past that. Devil, you have loosed me from the shame of yesterday, and I'm going forward and upward. Hallelujah. Well, that's pretty good. Supplication. Say sup, y'all. Prayer is a secret place of manifestation of God. Prayer is a place of destiny and transformation. Uh, The next thing God spoke to me about was a divine habitation. He said the presence of God is the secret of God's manifestation. I got seven keys to manifest revival in today's society, but all of them stem from 1 Kings 18.30, the world we started. They all start. Are y'all okay? Pastor Fair preached for two hours this morning, so don't cut me, don't cut me short just because she preached two hours. I mean, don't, don't say I'm wore out. She wore me out this morning. How many of you enjoyed that message this morning? Yeah, we're going to have to air that one for sure. That's a good word. Number one, point number one, after one hour, point number one. 
This is how we're going to manifest revival to the world around us. First, we're going to what? Repair our altar. But number one, what's it going to do to us to give us the keys to manifesting as sons and daughters of God? That's revivalist. A son or daughter of God brings revival with them. They're in a revival. They're not trying to get one. They're in one. Now, that you have to manifest. The whole world is waiting on revival, and it don't know it. The whole world is groaning, waiting on the what? Manifestation of the sons and daughters of God. What's the manifestation of God? Reviving power, revival power, revival authority. What? These signs shall follow them that believe, right? All these things that that the world's waiting for is not going to be found. That's why Elijah said, do whatever you need to do. I can see, I feel like he fixed himself some lemonade. They had a fig tree probably there. He remember probably made fig Newtons, and he was leaning back, and he's like, just, just call him. Maybe he's asleep. I don't know. Try something louder. Get louder. I don't cut yourself. Do crazy things. I'm going to eat these fig newts and drink lemonade. I mean, he was being serious. He was like, y'all just do whatever you need to do because I know God is going to answer, and he's the only one that can answer with real fire. And the Lord spoke to me today. He said the same four buckets of water the similarities were the first miracle at the Cana of Galilee at the wedding feast when Jesus said, get me four buckets. Fire fell that day and transformed. There was a place of presence. There was a place of power. There was a place of authority. And Elijah called down fire, and the fire can't fall till we fix the altar. Somebody say, fix the altar. Number one, consecration. I'll be quick. I'll be quick. Consecration, to make or declare sacred, to, to devote irrevocably to the worship of God by a solemn ceremony. This is being set apart for God, set apart from the crowd. Human consecration is a gate for manifestation. Y'all ain't saying much, you must be right. Human consecration is a gate for manifestation. God can't use something that's not set apart. Quit trying to look like the world to win the world. They're putting on bigger shows. And here's, can I, wow, yeah. I got to get these seven things. I got to get these seven things, Lord. Quit, help me, Holy Ghost. The king pulled aside in Daniel's day the best-looking, the most well-trained, the most qualified individuals to serve in the kingdom. All the rejects he left out. The devil's always trying to recruit the best so they can shine brighter. Why is the music so good? Why are they drawing such crowds? Because believe it or not, whether you like it or not, they're actually very gifted. I mean, I don't even think Taylor Swift can swing, swing, sing. She can swing, but I don't think she can sing. That's that kind of flowed together just right anyway. Totally a tongue twister there, but I think God was trying to say something. I mean, I don't even think girl can, can sing. But, boy, she puts on a show, and she's got two jets flying all over the world, and people are following her like crazy. And she's moving a nation in thoughts and processes for political agenda. Tell me the devil's not using her. I don't think she's gifted because there's light in me. When I look at her, I just go, God, what are we doing here? Y'all paid 140 watt for that ticket? Dum, da, dum, dum. Anyway, moving on. Probably more than that, yeah. And she goes all over the world. Japan, they don't even understand what she's saying. They're like, what? crazy 
crazy. Genesis 32, 24, consecration, and Jacob was what? Left alone. I'm not going to read any more of that scripture. <laughs> he was left alone with God. And Jacob was left alone with God. He got touched. When you get along with God, you're going to get separated, consecrated. Amen. Number two, number two, when you get along with God, when you get along with God, when you start, listen, scheduling Him on your calendar, when you begin to schedule Sunday night service, when you begin to schedule prayer time, when you begin to schedule outreach, when you begin to schedule and give up three hours of your Wednesday, I asked her the other day, please forgive me for saying this out loud. I said, how old are you? How old are you again? Let me say it again. 82, 82. How long do you drive to get here for class? About an hour and 15 minutes. And how much class do you stay for? The whole thing. So she's here for three hours. She's 81. She drives an hour and 15 minutes to get here. Come on, somebody. She's here four hours and 30 minutes. And then she's here. No, she's here. She drives the whole thing's four hours, about, well, four hours, five hours and 30 minutes. Yeah, three, four, five hours and 30 minutes. And forgive me, I know we're not live and you can edit this, but then she goes and takes care of her husband, Jim. Don't tell me she's not under pressure and don't have anything she can be doing. Don't tell me she don't need rest. But she sees it's worth investment. She's getting something. She, she's gaining knowledge. She's gaining instruction. Her life's getting better. Even though her life is hard, her life's getting better. Why? Because she's setting apart time to grow, to learn, and listen, not only that, but to pray. Amen. What you're desperate for, you'll have time for. Amen, preacher. You say, you shouldn't yell at us, Pastor. Look, Pastor Farron never even raised her voice this morning. Leave me alone. If she wasn't nice, to you, she wasn't nice enough for you this morning, I'm not going to be able to balance this out for you tonight. I can tell you that. Say desperation. Desperation sounds rough. It really doesn't mean what you think it means. It means you're bold, dangerous, Daring, determined, frantic, frenzied, furious, and violent. Say, I'm desperate. Matthew eleven twelve, 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violent, and the violent take it by force. The question is, what do you want from God, and what do you want in life, and how desperately do you want it? You know what I've heard over the last seven years pastoring this church? Excuses. You know what you do in this world when you make a lot of excuses? You lose your opportunity. Well, man of God, Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. I want you to go to a place, and I'm not going to tell you where you're going I'm not going to tell you how hard it's going to be. I want you to leave everybody you know, and I want you to go a direction I tell you to go, and I don't want you to worry about anything. Go. Well, you know, Elisha plowing in a field. Elijah comes along, throws his mantle on Elisha. He feels something. There's an impartation. There's a moment. There's a transfer. There's a moment that his spirit jumps just like Mary and Elizabeth. There has to be. Look, if there's not something internally happening to you in your spirit while you're listening to someone, please, under God, please hear my heart. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I don't want to lose you. I want you to grow. Go where you can grow. Don't go where you're going to be comfortable. Don't go where they're going to preach to your flesh. Don't go where they're going to make you emotional and make you feel happy and make you feel good about what you're hearing. Don't go there. But if you're going somewhere where your spirit is moving, then go there. But don't move for emotional reasons. Are you okay? 
desperation. Elisha, <laughs> Elijah said, look, uh, I'm going this way. Elisha said, I'm going to go. Let me go do this first. Elisha said, well, do whatever you got to do. That's what I'd say to you. Whatever you got to do to cut ties with everything you used to do so God can separate you for a purpose, then do it. And if you can't cut ties, stay where you are. But I'm telling you, if you stay where you are, and miss God, that's on you, not me. And, and you're going to stand before God. I love the way Pastor Fair said it, and I want her to get her notes up so she can, say, she can hand it to me and I can read it, about uh, your destiny, about if you don't, that you're going to stand before God for what you've done, and he's going to open it up and show you the, the, what happened with your life and then who you hurt by it. He's going to big screen your life. He's going to say, this is where you messed up. And these are the people you hurt by your decision. He said, why would he do that? <laughs> it says he will. Because he's God and he can. I don't know about you, but I don't want to stand before God and him say, Jeff, this is where you missed it. This is where you disobeyed. This is where you didn't listen. This is where you got in your flesh. This is where you should have did this, and you did this instead, and you know you disobeyed. Yes, I forgive you. Yes, I love you, and I'm going to let you enter in, but look at all the things that didn't happen, or look, I had to get two more people to step up to try to fix this after you messed this up. You got it? Yes, ma'am. I know. She's getting good at these notes. So, 1 Samuel 1, 11, are you okay? We're going to point number three, but 1 Samuel number one, chapter 1, verse 11, and she vowed a vow. She vowed a vow, and she vowed a vow, and she vowed a vow. Are you listening? Many of you had made promises, and you've made promises to the Lord and to the body of Christ. You've made promises to God and to the body of Christ. If you vow a vow, keep it. You want to give birth to something amazing? Wasn't Samuel amazing? Huh? Wasn't he amazing? I want I want Paul's message in the verse, what, oh, I got you. You may be tempted to think your role is not very important, but there will come a day in heaven when God will dis display your part in his plan through the ages of heaven's movie screen. And you will see the great effect you had on others because you were steadfast and unmovable. Can I say this? If you're weak need, milk sop, Weeble wobbly, that effect's going to show too. If you're moved by your emotions, guess what you leave in the wake? Emotional wakes. Decisions, thoughts, processes that you're doing in your life right now, you're hurting or helping others. I hope you understand what I'm saying. I wanted to get that out. Number three, vision. I'm hurrying, I promise. It's 8.30. What time we start church? We've been here almost two hours. I'll be done in like just a few minutes. If you are to manifest a divine nature, you must see it ahead. You must become someone with a strong vision for your future. You must become a visionary. I said you must become a visionary. When you get in prayer, God will begin to speak to you about your future. And if he speaks to you about your future, you better pursue it. And if you don't know and you're confused, God is not the author of confusion. As soon as I'm not clear, I discount it. You say, why? Because I know God's voice. I, I talk to him every day. I don't show up in my life in some situation. I don't know what I'm going to do. I've not done that for years. Why, do you, why are you showing up in situations not knowing what you're going to do? 
Can I tell you why? Because you don't spend time with God. When you constantly say, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know where we're going to go. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to get a job. I don't know. You know what that tells me? You're not talking to God. You had no vision. Right? You're not, you're not, get, God will speak to you. And the more you're in his word and the more you're around him, the more you know his voice and you don't show up in confusing places. If you're still showing up 20 years in, in the Christianity and you go, I don't know how I got here. You led yourself there. Ignorance led you there. Stupidity gone to seed led you there. Wait, I should say it nicer. You, you led yourself there in a way, you know. You made some poor choices, some bad decisions. And here we are. After all, everybody makes bad decisions. Yeah. Yeah, you get one cho- you get one of these. Life. You get one. You get one opportunity to, to fulfill the destiny that God has for you. Yeah, I, I, want, I want you to hear God's voice. I want you to hear him clearly, and I want you to talk to him till you know his voice. I want you to talk to him so much I can't talk you out of it. He come to me. Uh, it was probably, I don't know, two years before he finally said he was called to preach. He come to me two years before that. He said, I believe I'm called to pastor. I said, you're an idiot. You're an absolute idiot, a blooming idiot. You're not called at all. He come up to me about a year and a half later. He said, Pastor, I believe you're wrong. I said, it's about time. I can talk you out of it. You never were called. You're waiting on me to, to justify your call from God or your purpose or your destiny or your plan. You're waiting on me to tell you what God's told you to do or to agree with it. You don't need me. Paul said, when I heard the voice of God, I didn't confer with the flesh. I didn't ask you. I didn't ask you. And I didn't even ask me. I said, yes, God, that's what we'll do. What am I trying to help you do? Learn how to be a Christian. Learn how to live a happy life. Learn how to have joy in the midst of situations. When you show up in a situation, you won't go, I don't know how we got I don't know what to do. Well, talk to God. Amen, somebody. Say amen. Say hallelujah. Say my bishop loves me. That's why he talks to me this way. Proof, rebuke, and correction. That's why I'm here. Amen. I'm in this for you. My mama told me when I was a boy, she said, boy, don't touch that stove. It's hot. I went, huh, okay. Oh, my gosh. Mom, that's hot. My skin's on the eye, and it's off my hand. She said, I know. I told you. That's a good mama. I was a dumb kid. I don't want to see you get the skin peeled off your hand. (laughs) Right? I want to help you. Can I give you like three more? I think so. Okay, well, we already did supplication. That was one of them. What's that mean? To ask earnestly, right? It's a transformation place. When you get in a place of humility, God can speak to you. You keep going into prayer telling him what you're going to do. You ever had somebody come to you and say, look, I want to ask you what you, I, this happens to me all the time. This is a crazy one. This is a good one. I love, you'll love this one. You'll love this one. Hey, pastor, uh, <clears throat> I'm thinking about, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to change jobs. Oh, yeah, where are you going to go? Well, uh, you know, I, I, over here there's a place, you know, they can do this. And, and uh, what do you think about it? What do you think about it? Well, I don't know. I hadn't had a chance to pray. Let me pray. Uh, let me pray. I'll get back with you. Well, I started yesterday. It's a little late to come ask me what I think about it now that you've already done it. Right? 
but that's the way we do God. We, we make decisions without his authority or his, his response, and we show up in prayer and want him to. Well, which way do you go? You told me the other day you done them right. Which, is it this way? Top, down, left, right. Okay. So, so you know, you, you, know and you're, you want him to bless it. You go into prayer and you say, God, this is what we're doing. And he says, I didn't, I didn't know anything about this. Well, I want you to put your stamp of approval on it and bless it even though it's disobedience. Even though I've stepped out of your wheel, can you, can you correct this thing? That's why I, I said the other day, you know, I've said this many times now. God gave me this revelation years ago. I had preachers and people in my life even had tags in the parking lot. God's my co-pilot. I, I thought one day, I thought, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. What idiot wants God over there correcting courses when they mess up? I want him over here, and I'm going to go over here. And I'm just going to look at him and smile. You're doing great, sir. Yes, we'll go where you want to go. We'll fly. Jesus Airlines today. I want a lot of miles on Jesus Airlines. I want him to be flying the plane. Come on. I, I, come on. I, I don't want a co-pilot. I, I want him to fly this thing, man. I, I don't want to go a direction he don't want me to go. I don't want to do something he don't want me to do. God, lead me. You know the biggest, biggest word you can get in your mouth? Write this one down. Write this one. This will, this will be good. Are you ready? Are you ready? All right. You ready? Ready? Help. I need somebody help. Does anybody help? Help. When I was younger, so much younger than today. Never needed anybody's help in any way. <clears throat> but now those days are gone. I'm not so self-assured. Now find a change of mind and open up the door. Help me if you can, I'm feeling down. Some of y'all remember that, don't you? Help. Help. That's supplication. Go into the room like you don't know anything about what you're supposed to do and say, God, help me. Amen. Quit thinking you know everything. Quit being too dumb to ask. Amen. Amen. Let me wander around in here, God. I got all kinds of days left. Uh, you don't have to speak to me. You don't have to clarify this. Just let me look stupid. No, he's not going to do that. You're just not talking to him. And if you do talk to him, the answer he's giving you, you don't want to hear. That's why you're tearing. He's already told you what he wants you to do, but you're not willing to do it because your flesh is trying to move you instead of your spirit. Good God, that's worth writing down. Never said it before, so that was worth having. I hope you got it on tape or somewhere. Does that any good? Because I don't have it. It's not in my mouth or my mind. It was in my spirit. I really want to say it again. I don't have it. <laughs> it was so good it took me out of the spirit. If you ain't never done this before, you don't know what I'm talking about. It gets like this sometimes, and when you start speaking, it's like, God had never shook you out of your body when he spoke to you. You're not understanding what I'm talking about. God can say one word and bring you plumb into sobriety and shook you where you, you're, you're going to try to chew it. Can somebody play that back for me? She's got it on recording. You recorded it. 
Okay. Divine habitation, number five, divine habitation. I said that briefly, right? The presence of God is the secret of God's manifestation. Genesis 39, 21, but the Lord was with Joseph, showed him mercy, gave him favor in the sight of the keeper, what, of the prison. Here's what I'm trying to get you to understand. Divine habitation, when he inhabits you and he's with you, he, he, look, then you begin to manifest in any situation. There is no situation you can find yourself in that you can't manifest God's presence and favor as long as you have a divine habitation. And how do you do that? By repairing the altar. God don't show. Yes, he shows up in emergencies, but not when you've been walking in disobedience for a while. He may let you simmer. See, some of you need to learn about your kids and your family and your people around you that you are not the divine answer for their life. If you keep being the divine answer for their life, they'll never find God. They'll always serve you. Okay. Number seven. Did I say I had seven points? We're on number seven. Ta da! Impartation. You only got six? What? What? Supplication. Divine habitation. Here's number six. It's at the bottom of the page down here. I missed it. <laughs> Ready? Scratch number seven for now. We're going to do number six. Revelation. When you get into prayer, you rebuild an altar, God begins to speak to you. Revelation, the definition is an act of revealing or communicating divine truth, something that is revealed by God to human persons. God still speaks today. What does he say? Surprise, surprise, surprise. Gomer Powell says, surprise, surprise, surprise. Golly. If you're just reading the Bible to be reading a book, you should just pick up a Harlequin romance. If you just read it like the newspaper, just hear me. If you're just reading it like a newspaper, like it's a story that don't affect you, it's about somebody else, and you're not, if you're not allowing it to leave the page and become part of your life and then begin to transform you and give you revelation that changes you, and God can speak to you in a place of prayer. Speak fresh words from heaven, manna, rhema. Manna dropped every day. There's always some correlation in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Manna dropped every day for the day, and then the next day, yesterday's word wasn't for today. I want to run because God speaks to me every day. You should be excited about getting alone with God and getting a fresh word. You feel him show up. When you get past goosebumps and pimp sickles or whatever, I don't know. Pimp sickles, I don't know. Pop sickles. We well, back on what's her name again? What's her name? What's her name again? The lady who sung. Taylor Swift, Swift, yeah. I went back to Taylor Swift said pimp sickles. But anyway. <laughs> my ears are not even red. That's the problem. Like my, I don't even blush. <laughs> when you get past the, you know, Look, look, I understand, but as long as we're just in, you know, God forgive me, Lord, help me, help me. Let me bring you back to earth. 
Are you listening? I got one more point. So, can I help y'all? Can I help y'all with something? Worship music. It, listen, listen. The enemy is really good at emotionalism. And I have been around a lot of people who can sing songs, worship songs, like all they want is worship. They don't want no word, and they just play worship music, and all they get is worship, 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 and singing and singing. And, and then some folks just like old songs because they move them. The old songs move me. I can even remember the Red Book hymnal songs move me. Some of them got to have Bethel music. Some of them got to have, you know, always something, always something that's moving us. And you get an emotional high and you ride the buzz of the music and, and you think, you go home and the preacher never preached anything that solidified anything in your spirit. Nobody, but you go home and you're like, man, this is good. And you play your worship. When you wake up, you play your worship music. Look, you could play, you could play Hell's Bells or you can play worship music, either one. Both of them will move you. Might be the wrong way. ACDC, Hell's Bells. You don't remember that? Yeah, well, praise the Lord. We're happy for you. How dumb my mama was. That was the first cassette tape she bought me. ACDC, black, back in black. I got the revelation one day. I was sitting there smoking a joint, listening to ACDC back in black. And, and the Lord spoke to me, a lost man. Didn't know Christ. He spoke to me. He said, Count the bells. I said, Okay. Boom. Boom. You want to guess how many there were? 13. There's always something working inside of music that if you're not aware, you'll be in your emotions and not in the spirit. I want to hear God speak to me. Amen? I, I want to worship him, yes, but at the same time, the only reason I ever get into his presence is to get direction or a word, right? I want to, I, we worship, our whole life should be worship. I'm going to say it over here, y'all didn't have much reaction. I'm going to say, your whole life should be worship. Everywhere you go, everything you do, everybody you're around, the action, your job, your occupation, your character, everything should declare the glory of God. Everything you do should be for Him. Everything should be worship. It shouldn't be goosebumps. Are you okay? Number seven. And we're done. Did I make my point? No goose pimples. Pimp sickles. Impartation. Acts 4.13 is where I'm going to end. And you can't put it on the screen, can you? Get your Bible. Do me a favor. 
Get a Bible. Four thirteen. Watch, watch what, watch what happened. He, here, these, here, these Pharisees, these Sadducees, these folks in this town were, and here they, they made this, they made this clear. Watch what it said. Now, as they observed the what confidence. Right? Of Peter and John, they understood that they were uneducated and untrained men. They were amazed and began to recognize them as have been or having been with Jesus. When you get around him, there is no barrier to what you can receive by the way of impartation into your life. He can override what you don't know. untrained, unlearned, uneducated. Here's what I'm trying to get, get you to understand. You can get in his presence. Give that to me in the Amplified Classic. Can you? Okay. Uh, if you can't, I'll read it out of Pastor Fair's Bible. Yeah, same one. Acts 4.13. Good, it'll be bigger up there than it will on here. Now, when they saw the what? Boldness. What did I say desperation was? What did I say desperation was? Y'all wasn't paying attention. Let me go back. Point number one. Thank you. Boldness. Bold. Desperation means courage. Bold. Confidence. Not, not like you're trying. No, that you know you're bold, desperate, courageous. When they saw the boldness and unfettered eloquence, Holy Ghost will make you look smart, of uh, Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and untrained in the schools of common men with no educational advantages, they marveled. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. One more translation. I really like the Message Bible. Just one more, and I promise I'm done. Them's cool boots. You're welcome. That's it. They couldn't take their eyes off of him. Peter and John standing there so confident, so sure of themselves. Their fascination deepened when they realized these two were laymen with no training in Scripture or formal education. They recognized them as companions. Not that he had just been with Jesus. Not that they had been around Jesus. No, but Jesus was a companion of theirs. They, he was a friend. He was someone who, who walked with them. At, they carried something from him to where they were. Are you carrying anything from your place with him? The world is waiting to be amazed by someone who's been alone with him. The world is waiting on a group of people who will get with God and go into the world and amaze the world around them. Are you going to schedule him tomorrow on your calendar? 
If you need prayer for healing in your body. I heard uh, in my spirit, and this may be for someone later, so make sure if we air this, we don't cut this out. Uh, the, someone's dealing with digestive tract problems. I'm talking about, um, it's like, um, it's not just that, but it's esophagus problems, like possibly uh, acid reflux or something along those lines. Digestive tract, acid reflux, something like that.